As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, at 10 a.m., we'll be celebrating the blessing of the animals um, in honor of St. Francis. St. Francis Day is October 4th, and many churches, particularly many Episcopal churches, I don't know why this is, um, have this tradition of the blessing of the animals. Um, I have to say, it, it was not a tradition here at Grace Church. I think it maybe had been done once or twice in the past uh, when I came, but we, we started it, and I think now we can safely say it's a tradition having done it probably five years only with the exception of the uh, of the pandemic last year um, and my previous church St. Luke's in Hollister it, uh, the blessing of the animals was a well entrenched tradition they had been doing it for at least 20 years and if I had suggested maybe we'll skip the blessing of the animals this year that might have been my head on the platter instead of John the Baptist's um, and when I first arrived at St. Luke's in, um, in early 2009, I noticed something in the sanctuary. It's a small redwood chapel about the size of our old Grace Church here, the, the forward part of the church. Uh, and the, the, there are three large stained glass windows behind the altar. The central one is of Christ. And on one side is the nativity, the birth of Christ. And the other side is the triumphal entry of Palm Sunday procession into Jerusalem. And I noted what I noticed about these windows that there was a there was a dog in both of the windows. There's a dog in uh, at the nativity scene with you know the sheep and the oxen, the normal animals you'd expect to see there. The dog is sort of peeking over the manger at baby Jesus, and in the in the triumphal entry, there's a dog trotting alongside the the donkey that Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. And so I, I thought, well, there must be some Christian symbolism to dogs that I'm unaware of. So I did a lot of research, came up completely empty handed, and then went to my predecessor who had been rector of this church for uh, over 20 years. And I asked her, what's with the dogs in the windows? What, what do they mean? I can't figure it out. And she said, oh, I think those were probably just the dogs of the people who gave the money to make the windows and they wanted their dogs in the windows. <laughs> so I don't know that we've put any dogs in the Grace Church windows. I'm gonna have to double check with Whitney, but I do think we also love our dogs and we also love this tradition of the blessing of the animals. And I think, um, I think we love our pets if possible now, even more than ever. I know a lot of people who got pandemic pets after the last year and a half, uh, what a year and a half it's been. People's animals have been a source of comfort to them um, and even a lifeline. My sister I know got two, uh, two pandemic kittens in March of 2020 and they have become um, so important to her. And I think one of the reasons that animals are so important to us is that they can ground us. Our pets are closer to nature than we are, right? They don't worry about um, what they're gonna wear or what people are gonna think about them. Um, they don't they don't get stuck in their heads. They don't have to deal with monkey mind. You know, it should probably be called human mind and not monkey mind. Um, they are just present with whatever is. And when they're hungry, they're hungry, you know, and when they're happy, they're happy and they're gonna let you know it. Um, and, and I think there's a reason why, why, why getting in touch with our pets grounds us. It grounds us physically in our own bodies. Our own bodies are also closer to nature and we can experience this also just taking a walk just being aware of the changing of the seasons or the changes in the natural world around us throughout the day um, some people love to garden i took my kids for a walk a couple weeks ago and we had that really light rain um, on friday morning i said let's let's go like see what's different let's go smell the earth and see if there's any puddles left from the rain all of this connecting with nature can ground us in our bodies. And as I've learned a little bit more about trauma and the way that trauma can, can get us sort of stuck in certain patterns, grounding in our bodies and in the physical world and in nature just brings us down. It just, just gets us present. It's an incredible gift that's always available to us um, and that we always need. I have to say the last year and a half, um, certainly before that, but during this period of time, nature has also become um, a source of increasing worry and increasing peril as people have experienced. We've experienced wildfires, um, people have experienced floods, hurricanes, tornadoes all across our country and across our world that increasingly have claimed lives, um, have um, destroyed property and livelihoods and, and whole communities. 
Um, I learned when I was living in El Salvador in the um, 2000s, they, they uh, would refuse to call anything a natural disaster. <laughs> They say, in their experience, a disaster is because, you know, humans put something in the wrong place. So there would be a mudslide, and the mudslide was because the hillside had been deforested, and then somebody built a community at the bottom of the hillside because those people weren't allowed to live somewhere else, and then their community was, was covered in mud. That's a, that, they don't call that a natural disaster. They say that's a human disaster. And I think um, what we're seeing is more and more of, of the peril, uh, the beauty and the peril that nature puts us in is a human disaster, right? And we, we know this, we know that um, our veracity, human veracity has, has contributed to uh, the climate crisis that we're living in. And it's a moral crisis, it's an ethical crisis, it's a global crisis. We see so many examples of that in the Bible, going back to the very beginning of Genesis, to the, to the Tower of Babel, right? The humans can't quite get enough. They're just gonna build it higher and higher. They're gonna take more and more until God says enough and it's brought down. So there's something about these disasters, these situations that we're put in that can also humble us, that can also bring us down to our most natural state, which is we're, we're part of nature. Right? We're part of the creation. We're subject to it in every way that the other creatures are, only we also have the ability to influence it for good or for bad. For me, our oak tree has been an incredible symbol of both the beauty and the, and the abundance and the gifts of nature and the, and the great peril of nature. Just these last few months, I feel like our oak tree's been talking to us. Anna and I have actually gone out and said, oak tree, what are you saying? We're trying to listen to you. Um, in the month of August, our beautiful heritage oak, just outside the door here, the, the, the tree that the church was literally built around and reconfigured around, um, dropped at least three, on three separate occasions, large branches from high up in the tree. And the first one happened when we were having our neighborhood shepherding meeting and we heard this big crash and went around and looked and there was a large branch stuck up high on the roof. Um, people said, what does it mean? And I said, I think maybe that we need a neighborhood shepherding program because you never know what's going to happen. Um, another one fell without incident, but over the fence into the, the Catholic church uh, playground. And then another one fell just a couple weeks later. We, we came out here for a Sunday 8 a.m. service and the columbarium was filled with these massive oak branches that did do some damage to the columbarium. And the arborist told us that the tree, when it gets hot, when it gets really hot and dry, as it's been over 90 degrees, 95 degrees, the tree sort of shuts down. It can't continue to absorb water. And the incredible weight of the acorn crop this year, plus the fact that it, its, its branches were more brittle from that, those hot and dry periods caused this sort of cracking and snapping. Um, and even more interesting, the places where it cracked and snapped were places where there had been wounds and scars in the tree before. Isn't that interesting? Um, but we know that this tree actually has its taproot down in an aquifer, in a, in a spring that runs under, under Spring Street. That's what Spring Street's named after, and it runs under our whole property. John Sales knows way more about this and others of you than I do. But I understand there's like an underground river here, and that oak tree has that as its primary source of water. We don't know how much water is in there right now. So we've started to add water, give the tree more water during the cooler periods at night and other times when it can absorb the water. So we, we hope the tree is going to stop talking to us in that particular perilous way. The tree's also been gifting us in, in a way that seems almost ridiculous. I've lived in California my entire life and I've never seen an oak tree drop this many acorns. And I have to tell you, I, I know because I looked very carefully last year, not one acorn last year, 2020. 2021, a bumper crop. We sweep the patio, an hour later, it's littered with acorns. We have the 10 o'clock service, even indoors at the 8 o'clock service, we hear pow, 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 pow as the acorns hit the roof and the squirrels are going nuts and they're, the children are going nuts. I have them collecting buckets and buckets of acorns to hopefully do an oak tree propagation restoration project. The tree is giving in abundance. When I think about the acorns as the primary food source of the Onastasis, the Wapo, like what an incredible year this would have been, you know, to store up all of this food that the tree is giving us. 
So I've asked my tree experts, and there's different opinions about this bumper crop, about why the tree is giving us so many acorns this year. So some people say it's because the tree kind of can sense the future. It knows we're gonna have a particularly wet winter. And so it puts out a lot of acorns to give its progeny the best chance at kind of coming up and restoring the forest. Other people say it's looking to the future, but it's the opposite reason. It's gonna be an especially dry winter. And so for the, the tree is also trying to ensure by putting out so many acorns that at least a few will have a chance, right? But I just learned yesterday, one of my tree experts talked to another tree expert and learned that it's actually maybe not what's gonna happen in the future, but what happened in the past that's giving the tree this abundant crop. So what he said was that the two winters ago that we had an especially wet winter is when the crop that we're receiving now, the crop of acorns was set in the trees, um, in, in wherever the tree makes acorns inside of itself. And, and so it's not, it's not the, the future what the tree is hoping to give, but what the tree's already received that is, that is allowing it to give now in such abundance. And so I want to read you a little portion of, of the Gospel of Matthew to see, um, to, this is now from the message version, to see if we can hear a little bit of resonance there. This is from Matthew chapter 6. This is the lilies of the field passage. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax. To not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way God works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how God works. Steep your life in God reality. God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. I'm gonna read this one line again. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. God is giving to us in every moment, every moment. All we need to do is turn to our bodies, to our pets, to the natural world around us, to our, to our own breath. In order to connect with God's giving, in order to put our taproot into that spring that's ever flowing underneath our feet. And it's our ability to receive God's gifts in each and every moment, to live in the presence of God as our creatures are able to do, that allows us then to be able to give, to give forth an abundant crop. I know a lot of people are really worried right now. People are worried about the state of our country, about the state of our world, about the state of, of the natural world, about the climate crisis. There's so much to be worried about. We don't know if life as we know it is gonna be sustainable or continue. But if we can, can ground ourselves in the present moment, if we can live in God's presence, if we can partner with God then for the restoration of God's world, I think then, I think then we have a chance. Let's take a lesson from our pets today. Let's take a lesson from our oak tree. Let's put our tap roots down deep into what God's already giving us each and every moment. I've said these things to you in the name of our friend and savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. <laughs>